You are now live. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, happy Wonder Wednesday. It needs to be Friday. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, I'm already halfway there. My shoes are off already. We are halfway there. It's Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, we have to let you know these little things in our ear are new um, oh, mics likes. from Apple. So hopefully yeah. my hair doesn't make lots oh, of loud noises. We sound okay. No, put them over. It looks great. Yeah. Okay. Put it All right. Wow. wow. <laughs> Yeah. Like it. It's very professional. Yeah. All right. Half and okay. half, so it doesn't look like this. So today's topic, we're going to dive into breast lifts first, and then breast, breast lifts in combination with the breast augmentation. Um, that way, there's there's just this big need for, I think, further discussion for it. Clarity, yeah. Because patients come in all the time, and they're either one scared to death to have the scars from a breast lift, or they really want them both done at once, and they really probably shouldn't, or there's a couple different scenarios that we'll kind of dive into. Um, one, let's talk first about breast lifts and what makes somebody need a breast lift? That's probably the Absolutely. first place to go. It's one of the most common questions I get is how do I know if I need a breast lift? And there are certain measurements we can take from the sternal notch to the nipples and from the nipples to the breast fold. And there are some averages, but they really don't tell the whole story. Right. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, the amount of sag can be different when you look at the nipple versus the breast tissue itself. Mm -hmm. And number two, some people just have a lower set breast. We all have what we call a breast footprint, which is where the breast lives on the chest. And yeah. for some people, it's just lower. So even though they want their breasts higher, they're not going to go there. When we so, go into that and explain the footprint in the rooms, it just kind of makes a light walk with patients oh, to understand and it did what for does me the too when mean. I finally learned that concept. Right. And it's kind of like it tells you the borders of where your breast lies and kind of what borders you shouldn't go out of. Yeah. So let's look at that first. So this is a diagram of a breast. And the footprint, I can get the drawing tool. The footprint is everything from where your fold is. And most people's folds are slightly under their breast tissue, but for a perfectly perky, no sag breast, sometimes the fold is legitimately under the breast. But the fold is the bottom of the breast. The inner border of the breast is where your cleavage stops when you push your breasts together. There's usually a line. It's a stopping point. It's a stopping point. The lateral border of the breast is generally the front of the armpit, but some people have more natural breast tissue on the side. Some people have a breast that ends a little bit before their armpit. And the upper breast border, it's usually somewhere slightly below the armpit. And it's basically where if you push your breast up, that's where you're gonna see that crease or that line. There's technically a small amount of breast tissue that goes all the way up to the collarbone, mm -hmm. but where we're really limited for a lift is where this bottom border of the breast is, because it's very difficult to actually raise that right. border up. So that's breast footprint. Okay. Down um, close. There you go. Done safe. So now I want to talk about the different types of sag. Before I do that on a technical level, I kind of want to give a couple quick and dirty tips to people who wonder, should I get a breast lift or not? Tip one, if you do this all in front of the mirror yes. all the time, <laughs> you probably need a breast we lift. We that to <laughs> that one patient today because she was really on the line of like, yeah, I really don't want these scars, but I really don't know what I want to do. I'm very confused. And we just said, are you going in front of a mirror and lifting? Because if you're lifting, implants aren't going to make no. miraculously your breasts They're rise up. No. So might bring very it few people, if they're <laughs> empty, deflated skin, an implant would no fill sag. out that skin. But for people with real breast tissue or who have implants already and right. want them to be higher, most of the time we're talking about breast right. lift. Um, second thing that could be a clue that you need a breast lift is if you can put a pencil under your breast without a bra <laughs> on a and it stays there, <laughs> that means you have enough what we call glandular ptosis, meaning there's enough of your breast that's fallen below the breast border, that, right. that bottom of the footprint, that it may be worthwhile to get a lift. And the third thing is if somebody says, well, I like my breasts when I do this in the mirror <laughs> and raise your arms, that's also a lift. Yeah. Yeah. So now we'll get into kind of the different grades of ptosis because I talk a lot about ptosis and patients wonder what it is. And when I was a resident, I really remember them talking about three grades of ptosis. Grade one ptosis is where your nipple is still above the fold. You can tilt it backwards a little. Oh, there back. we go. Oh, this yeah, forward. back. There we so go. this is a no sag breast. All of the breast tissues above the bottom board of the breast the nipple points generally up at 10 to 20 degrees, which is kind of the ideal breast shape and mm -hmm. fullness. And about 45% of the volume of the breast is above the nipple. Mm -hmm. 
and about 55% of the fullness is below the nipple. Once you get to grade one sag, which is what most 20-somethings have who have more than an A cup mm -hmm. or so, the nipple is now kind of just at or above the level of the fold, and you start to lose some of that fullness in the upper part of the breast, and it starts to become a little more bottom heavy. Grade two is where the nipple is below the fold, and that's generally where the borderline comes in between, can we get a lift by filling things out right. with an implant, versus yeah. Yeah. no, not so much. Grade three means the nipple's pointing at the floor, and there is no way to do anything with that breast except lift it, unless you want it to Bring look it the same. Up. <laughs> I've had older ladies say, well, this is natural, this is appropriate for my age, right. I just want to put an implant in, and one of two things happens. Either the implant volume goes... Up here. Yes, and we I can draw that. Perfect. Either the implant volume goes way up here, and you get this humpy, long breast. Snoopy. Or the implant goes down here, and you get a rock and a sock. Yeah. Either way, most people end up not being very happy with that. Yeah. The next thing I want to talk about is pseudotosis. Now this is somebody whose nipple is still well above the fold. And this is actually kind of common for somebody mm -hmm. after implants or breast reduction surgery where a lot of the tissue has fallen below the fold again, but the nipple's in the right place. And really, sometimes an implant can kind of fix that a little bit, but most of the time you're talking about yeah. reducing the amount of skin between that the nipple covers the breast between, between the nipple and the fold. here to here. And this last one, is something I really, it wasn't even on my radar in residency, but I see it so commonly. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that there are certain heritages, like yeah. Americans, yeah. Um, that have this shape of breast yep. where even though the distance from the nipple to the fold is short enough that it doesn't count measurement-wise mm -hmm. as somebody who needs a lift, the nipple is so low on the breast here, here. that it will look awkward or wrong right. if you don't reposition the nipple. Right. So these are all the different grades of ptosis, and these are the ones people think about commonly with relation to the nipple, but right. it's also important to think about what your breast tissue is doing in relation Underneath to the fold. Underneath the nipple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I think, um, I think we can get out of that one and we can go into talking about, dun dun dun, the scars. <laughs> yes. Because everybody freaks out about scars. They think, oh my gosh, my breasts are gonna look awful and horrible with scars, and there's multiple different kinds of scars um, there we can kind of go through about different lifts, because not everybody needs the full anchor, as we call it, um, scars. They may need just around the, nip, around the areola. Um, I guess dive into that, because yeah. I think it, it gets scary, because you can kind of see some before and afters of bad scars, and some people just don't scar well, yeah. and it's a trade-off, whether you really want really pretty breast in a bathing suit or clothing sure, or things yeah. like that or the scars so it's pretty rare to have scars bad enough that you can see them through a thin t-shirt but it is possible so if you have keloid scars other places on your body you may want to think much more seriously about doing a breast lift mm -hmm. than somebody who has been cut and operated on and has really very good <coughs> scars um, the periareolar lift sometimes call it a crescent lift or a Benelli lift, they're all sort of versions of the same thing, it means we're really trying to keep all the scarring around the border of the areola. I don't really like to think of that as a breast lift because it doesn't lift any of the breast tissue. Mm -hmm. It just can move your areola an inch or less Smidge up, up yeah. on your chest. And it can give you really wonky shaped areolas because they well, don't always heal perfectly circular. Yes, what I have seen a ton of is what I like to call the Strax breast. And I'm sure other places do it too, and there are some patients that go to Strax who don't get this, but I've seen it a thousand it's times. Really patients, I'm sure, whatever it's called. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> patients will come in having had SAG, and they say, oh, my surgeon didn't want to put scars on my breast, so they put in a really big implant and did a lift just around the areola. Well, the more skin you try to remove around the areola with a large implant, Number one, you get a bad scar because mm -hmm. there's a lot of tension on that scar and it will tend to spread and get about that wide and it just tends to look like stretched thin skin. Yeah. Um, and it also flattens the breast. The breast is supposed to have a slightly right. conical kind of cone shape. It flattens the front of it is what she means. Like yeah. your, your nipple and areola area starts to be like almost compressed. Again. Smushed. Yeah, smushed look. Yeah, and the skin is not designed to hold a lot of tension. So it can reposition the areola and nipple, like I said, about an inch or less, but if you're trying to shoot for more than that or trying to hike up the breast tissue with that, you're gonna end up with an oblong, stretched out areola. I've seen some women whose areolas were probably closed to be the standard size of about four centimeters after surgery, and I've seen them get as big as nine or 10 centimeters across. Where they're almost taking over the breast. 
breast. Yeah, it's about mm -hmm. half of the surface of the breast. And then if we want to convert that to a regular lift, it's very difficult to get all that areola pigment out and keep the size of the breast that now, that patient wants. I know wants. people that I know have voiced concerns about having natural breast and having over large areolas just naturally. And you can reduce those down Absolutely. because you're not trying to stuff an implant in there with the same time as reducing the areolas. So Absolutely. You can get a really pretty areola reduction if there's not a bunch of other moving parts. Kind right, of especially if we're lifting only or lifting and reducing the breast. Right. We really only see those issues when we're augmenting the breast and kind of trying to stretch the skin at the same time we're trying to make it smaller. So that goes to the big topic. Well, we haven't talked about the vertical or the other oh, lift yeah, yeah, yet. Yeah, yes. So That's we're right. still on lifts. We talked about hairy <laughs> areolar. The vertical lift adds a scar down the front of the breast that allows there's us to pinch out skin. Grab I don't think there. you can see the small no, not that easily. Not on that one. Nope. <laughs> she's upside down. Mm, and she's her. Let me get it. There's a whole diagram. Um, you go out, press lift. Ooh, that good. Well, this is the one that people call either the, the lollipop scar or I don't know, it's the vertical scar, or sometimes people call it the circumvertical scar. Mm, one it's that one. That one. So this go. is the area of tissue we're really removing. What the heck? I might have Sorry, I'm not used to picking this thing up and. No, it's not. It turned off. Oh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the scar would go around the areola because we, we move it up, and it also goes down the front of the breast to pinch out a little bit of skin side to side. Generally, if you don't have grade three ptosis, meaning your nipples are still relatively near your breast fold, and you don't have a lot of extra skin in the up and down direction, that's going to be a good option for you. So people who need just a little bit of a lift, or people who are kind of on the borderline for a lift and don't want an implant. And this looks scary. Because well, it looks like this is your scar. It's not. not that's the, scar. the opening. The that's scar is this. Yeah, and if you can't see it, I'm going to draw it so it's a little bit darker. It's around the areola and down the front of the breast. And yes, I can do a straighter line with a scalpel than I can do with a finger and an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's see. Is it good back that way? Oh, gosh, doggone it. I did that before, too. Okay. So the next lift incorporates not only removal of skin in this you direction. But removal of skin in this direction. And people get a little freaked out when they think about that full scar, but very rarely does it go from yeah. fold to fold. Most of the time, it's just a little scar hidden under the crease of the breast once it settles. Yeah, more like, more like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's not drawn anymore. Yeah. And you can tilt it too a little bit. Sorry, there this you thing go. does not. So play most of the time, it's better. a slightly shorter scar that's completely hidden beneath the breast once it relaxes a little bit. And the main purpose of doing that is for some patients, when we do this vertical lift, this pinching action can make this scar so long that either the nipple ends up poking out of the bra, mm -hmm. or you end up with a scar that goes below your breast fold. Or what about, let's talk about like, if somebody just does this vertical here and then avoids this one, it really can kind of distort the shape of the breast too. Absolutely. Because then you're now looking more pinched and pointy, and mm -hmm. you're losing this natural soft fold that the bottom of the breast is supposed to have. Yeah, so I try very hard not to ever have the distance from the nipple to the fold be above 9 or 10 centimeters mm -hmm. in surgery because that is really representative of a youthful breast and a C or D cup size. Of course, there are exceptions to that rule, right. but if that distance is longer than that after I've done the vertical, I almost always will incorporate a little bit of horizontal skin. Mel, can you too. actually see that scar from there? Um, kind of, sort of. If that's you, really how it heals over. I think well, I for, most people, for most people. If you give it two years, most people's scars will heal to a fine skin colored line that's not more than a millimeter or two wide. There can be a couple things that happen with scarring. Some people can have what we call hypertrophic scarring, which mm -hmm. means it gets thick like a rope, it gets hard and it gets firm. Scar creams can help, um, steroid injections can help that type of scarring. And we can always do a surgical revision of scars. There's a lot more tension and tightness on the scars when we're actually doing the breast lift. If we're just revising scars in the office, a lot of times there's less tension on the closure and things will feel better that time around. So I have had some patients where we've just redone the scar and it, it turns out looking better. For the first couple of months after surgery, almost everybody's scars are a little raised and a little pink. But like I said, given a couple of years, over 90% of patients have scars that are pretty imperceptible and because they're on the web. Um, okay, so this is one that's healed. And it was down. a pretty major, there you go. Perfect. major job. So it kind of just showed, oh my good boy, I swear. I give up. Thumb. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, holding this thing, it's not like holding a phone. I feel like it's like the boom box. <laughs> um, so she does have some stretch marks over here on the breast, which will kind of stay and be there, but as they 
were filled out with the implants, it did help them not be so dark and pigmented. But you can talk about, Dr. Goldberg, how the aerial incision around here and down, this is not that far out either. No, actually. I take most of my after pictures between six weeks and 12 weeks after surgery. Of course, we have patients that come back after that, but mm -hmm. not nearly as many as come in the first couple of months Biggest after follow-up. Biggest thing is seeing where her, this is from like that diagrams we yeah. saw, where it's pointing down. And now you can see the nipple position's up. The implant is, did we have an implant? No. We didn't have an implant. No. Um, hard to see from the side, but she, um, now you can see where the, the distance from the nipple to the fold, and now the breast is back up in the footprint of where the breast should be. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to know where your nipple should be, there's another little guideline. Um, halfway down your arm is about where your nipple should line up. So that's, again, why you can't always just right. cookie cutter say, oh, 18 oh, centimeters, here, yeah. 20 centimeters, because it's very different for different right. people. And aesthetically, we'll some patients are okay with their implant or implant or breast or nipple being a little lower than ideal. Right. Some people are comfortable with that and actually think it looks better and more natural. Yeah. So I like to talk to people too to figure out whether they do want to strive for that aesthetic ideal or whether their aesthetic goal is slightly different than that ideal breast. Right. So that kind of does go into like when people come in for a breast dog and they mm -hmm. you kind of go into that section of saying. Well, this is where your breasts are. This is where they will be, just fuller. Mm -hmm. And if if it's not so bad that we're like, listen, if you don't do the lift, it just isn't worth it. But then usually the patient says, you know, I really do like, I like the slope. I like the sag mm -hmm. to my breast. Then they're okay with it. But then there's some people who just need it in yes. order to achieve the right result with them. Yeah. And you know, patients shouldn't feel pressured to make you know, that decision by themselves. I mean, that's why doctors have a lot of experience. Right. And this is one of those surgeries where I feel like a lot of patients do need to go to two or three or four surgeons just to find somebody who they feel really understands yes. what their goals are and what they're looking for. Right. And doesn't just give them the surgeon's ideal aesthetic breast. Right. Because I've seen a couple of patients come in and they said, well, this is not any close to what I asked for, but the doctor said, oh, no, 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 you're not gonna be happy right. until I do a double D and it's just better for you. And you're a bigger gal and are be more proportionate and right and it totally was missing yeah what they wanted all in all but um so about lift and breast dog because Kim yeah it's that a just such times. a it's just a it's become more and more a topic of it can go one way or the other yeah and so when I finished residency my goal was to just make patients happy and blissfully naive <laughs> I just thought pretty much anybody could get an implant and get a lift at the same time. The further I've gone into practice, the more I realize that either you're going to compromise the lift because during a breast lift, sometimes we'll actually rearrange the breast tissue internally, right. which can interrupt some of the blood flow to the nipple. If we're also putting an implant behind it, there is much more risk of having scabbing or loss of the nipple and areola. Mm -hmm. If we stay on the safe side and don't really rearrange the breast tissue and just reduce the skin to lift the breast, then a lot of times patients will come back and say, well, they've re-sagged within mm -hmm. three to six months mm -hmm. and they're not happy. And I remember this happened with a girl just about six months ago yeah. where we told her very clearly, we recommend two stages. You will be happier with your result if you do the lift first, let everything settle, and then come back and put in an implant. She said, I'm gonna do it one well, way or another it. with another surgeon. Yeah. I really want you to do it. Would you please, please, please do it? Three months later, she was back in asking about how much it would be for a revision. And then you're almost doubling your cost of surgery. You're doubling your again. cost, then you're already doubling your downtime. And a lot of a lot of patients, that's really where they go. They're like, oh my gosh, ideally this is not what I want. I don't, and most of us, I mean, we don't want two surgeries. We want to right. get everything done and be done and recover and call it a day. But if it's, if you're going to outweigh the risk, anyway. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at double the cost, double the downtime. Mm -hmm. So regardless who what surgeon you go to, just make sure you really hear out what the pros and cons are. Yeah, and it's different for different patients. Right. If you have an A or a B cup and it's mostly loose skin and it's kind of deflated, you could do both at the same time pretty much any day. Yeah. If you've got a very full B or a C cup or a D cup and you want more fullness on top from an implant but you also want to lift, your breast tissue is so heavy, it is really going to resag unless we do an aggressive lift, which is just not usually safe to do at the same time. As we yeah, do. a really good um, thing, because a lot of women want this certain ideal breast that they maybe already have, like, so let's put in the scenario, there's a patient who has a D large breast, um, and they're like bringing in pictures of somebody with these tiny perky Bs, mm -hmm. and they're like, lift my breast, reduce them, and then make it more implant and not my breast. 
almost you're, like thinking about doing a sort of a mastectomy, right? In a sense, and removing a very large amount of breast tissue and putting the implant. Right, in. because ideally, if you just do a lift and you add the implant, you're not really going to go smaller. You're going to be bigger because you're adding yeah. volume and reducing. So, in that sense, it's definitely safer to reduce all the breast, make mm -hmm. a beautiful lift, make a beautiful breast, and then come back and kind of resize for the size of the implant. Yeah, right? and, and again, it depends on the patient. If you've just got a little need for a lift, you can do that at the same right. time. But if your breasts are down here, and they're a D cup, and you want them up here with volume, two stages is a safer option. Right, right. So um, the other thing was with the implants and lifts. We have one other thing we're gonna talk about. Um, oh, above or below the muscle, because if the oh. person has enough breast tissue, they can kind of camouflage and yes. limit their downtime. I guess go over that because that was one thing that a lot of patients we have offered to Absolutely. do. And then they're like, but I thought it has to be underneath the muscle. So for most patients, I do think below the muscle is a better call. Um, there's lower rates of capsular contracture, especially with smooth implants. And most patients who have a small amount of breast tissue or are pretty thin will have a more natural look and feel to the breast once it's under the muscle. There are some exceptions though. I have put a few smooth round implants above the muscle. I prefer to still do them below, but if somebody's really on the borderline for a lift and they've got a lot of breast tissue and they're willing to accept a slightly higher risk of capsular contracture, right. that can be a great plan for them that limits downtime. Personally, if I'm gonna put an implant above the muscle, I feel much more comfortable having to be a textured anatomic form stable, otherwise known as the gummy bear implant. Those have been shown to have lower yeah. rates of capsular contracture yeah, above gummy. the muscle. I can show what that is. Oh yeah, it's versus a smooth. Oh yeah, both. <laughs> we can kind of show you what these implants are, just to put it a little bit yeah. more into a visual. So that's where that's about the only patient population that I will kind of say if you're on the borderline for a lift, we could try with an implant and just a peri areolar. So say if it's why? this specific implant, and the reason is this implant has preferential fullness at the bottom, so it tends to push the nipple up and away from the body. It's also textured so it sticks in place and doesn't tend to settle lower on the chest. This implant, that's a round implant, is rounded across the front, so if you've mm -hmm. got any kind of nipple sag, it tends to just hang off the front right. of the implant. Once you go with it, with yeah. gravity. And as your breast settles, this is usually gonna settle down right. lower with it too. And when you move, like also if it's moving inside there, it's just kind of beating and beating and beating. Yeah, towards they the call that the drop. water hammer yeah. effect, and it can stretch out your capsule right. over time. Right. So if you do it under the muscle, then we can pretty much use any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not a huge fan of doing an aggressive lift with this implant under the muscle because as we tighten the skin over the bottom of the breast, it can push this a little higher than we want it, mm -hmm. and then it will stick there. These stick in place, and right. if they stick higher than you want You're them, you could end up with some laxity of the breast tissue underneath. So right. I prefer to do this if I'm just doing a very small vertical lift or a peri areolar, but not a big, big lift. Right. And I know there's there's surgeons who are comfortable doing that, but for me, it just hasn't worked out yeah. the best. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing, just based, just kind of, I think it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even notice you talk about it here, and I can't hear this here. Um, I guess the other thing was like, people who go to get um, a consultation, they probably do need a lift, and then they're like, no, just let's fill it all up with implant. Yeah. Let's just fill out all, the, your mom, you breastfed, in there. Um, and then somebody's just like, let's just fill it all out and we'll call it a day. That well, is a year long solution, basically. It lasts about a year to two years. And yeah. then you're right back where you started, but now you have a really large breast that's sagging. Yeah. And there's still la loss of fullness at the upper part of the breast. And now there's more heaviness and more tissue hanging over the hold. Right. So that is a possibility, again, for patients it's with a small fix. A cup or B cup. Oh, yeah, for that, yes. But anybody that's not a perfect candidate for just filling out loose skin, really needs to consider doing a lift. And, and that's, again, that's based on measurements yeah, and your that's what the consultation goals. is for. Exactly. Ultimately why, you know, a lot of people are like, but I need, I need, think I need a lift, I'm not sure if I need a lift. Well, go to, go to consultations, get opinions. And if you're across the board, every doctor's saying get a lift, <laughs> it's clear as day you need yeah. a lift. <laughs> but if you get and maybe be wary one, of yeah. like four doctors telling you you need a lift and one saying, no, no, we yeah. can do this. That, that's just some readers <laughs> going off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. That's it for like, combinations of breast lift yeah. and implants. We don't really dive into all the implants and augmentations, but we can no, do that next week. We can do, we can do a little bit of that. We've next week we can go into like actual breast augmentation and the newer implants that are out and stuff like that, that just came out over the last year and the different companies. And yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. All right.
Yeah. All right. So thank you for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, everybody. For Wind Down Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Get this thing out of my